Hi. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, I hope you had a an okay day, considering the warmth. <laughs> I hope you made it here okay. I hope you uh, didn't faint or something, because that would be bad. Um, <laughs> this is a good intro, right? I didn't prepare, as you can notice. But welcome to... Um, Welcome to West Berlin. We haven't had one of these proper scale meetups uh, every once in a while because nobody wants to speak <laughs> ever. <laughs> and also it's, it's, it's too much of an effort to make one of these, so. But we've done it. Um, we're gonna start, we have three talks, as you may have seen um, on the website. Um, first off, we're gonna start off, I mean, if you, if you, um, if you don't know, this whole uh, meetup is dedicated to Bindgen. Um, so it's kind of sort of a mini conference in a way. We have three talks. The first one is about uh, Wasm Bindgen, which is going to be by Ashley Williams, who's not here today, but she's here in spirit and also over the internet. <laughs> <laughs> so it's going to be a remote talk, which is interesting. Again, a bit smaller was this in the community space. Um, which up under the under the open tech school orgs, but just search for like Westville and you'll find it. Um, and in these ones, we don't have talks or anything. We just literally come and and hack on our last stuff. We don't have a topic. It's just you know nice. We sit together, we learn, and we program <laughs> because that's not as much effort as organizing this whole thing. Um, have I introduced myself? No. Uh, my name's Olivia. I'm one of the card organizers here of West Berlin, and right, that's that. Let's go on, <laughs> move on. Um, if you follow our Twitter, you may have seen that we have a new website, which is Berliners as uh, you know, as as a reference to oh, where's Firefox? Firefox um, as reference to you know the Berliner, the Pfannkuchen, the the <laughs> mysterious food item. Um, bagel, with ba bagel with filled bagel, ba donut with the hole. I don't know. <laughs> We're here for rust, anyways. So, <laughs> uh, right, this website um, is modeled after the uh, Cologne Rust user group, which we just kind of stole. Um, but sorry, with permission, obviously. Um, and it'll list all of our future talks and all of our past talks, so we have an archive. And as you can see, today's event is on there. Um, and we also have another event, which is not hosted by us, but by someone else, which is a Western tell, or kind of, it's kind of like you come together and you tell each other about um, what you what you've done using Rust. And this is probably designed to be a little more accessible than this meetup. Um, it's not a super formal, I mean, this isn't super formal, but it's not a formal, like, uh, uh, talk meetup, but it's mostly, like, you come together and it's sort of a lightning round in a way, and you tell each other about cool stuff that you're doing with Rust. Um, so that's happening in three weeks. So if you are excited for that, then visit this website and sign up. And it's a co-op, so in Kreuzberg. Um, and additionally, we, uh, because this is super relevant, um, the Exism West team, which is uh, uh, sort of, I don't know if you know what Exism is, is sort of a, a crowdsourced learning platform for various programming languages. And they're currently working on um, essentially redoing the West track. So you could go and have an impact there right now. And you, uh, if you want to mentor, if you, if you want to mentor, um, interested learners, people who are learning us, if you're interested in that, then um, go to, whoops, what was the website? Uh, Mentoring.exorcism.io and become a mentor. That's uh, not sponsored, by the way. Okay, let's go back to the presentation. Um, before we get started here, um, we follow our code of conduct, which if by attending this you've already agreed to. Um, so if there's any problems, um, regarding this code of conduct, if you see someone violating it or anything, then come talk to any of us, which is myself, Florian, Jan-Erik back there, whom some, the half of you can't see, 
And I think that's the three most important people. Um, so yeah, I think we're gonna kick off with our first talk, which is hopefully gonna work. So I think we're gonna have a bit of setup time, but enjoy the event, meetup, whatever this is. Um, okay, I don't know, I, is it, do we switch over to Ashley's video feed? Ooh, okay, that's half of the monitors. <laughs> Two more, three more. Yes, okay, I'm gonna hand over to Ashley. Hello, can you hear me? Yay. Yay. Woo. Uh, I don't think you can see me. This is my, this, that's a lie. This is not my first remote talk, but this is my first remote talk at this location and they're all different and special. So we'll see how this goes. Oh, look, my slides disappeared. And that's my face. Um, <laughs> hi. So I'm not just a floating voice, I'm a person. Uh, now there's two of my faces. This is computers, right? Oh, man. All right. I think we've got it. All right. Cool. Um, so I am here to talk to you today about WASM Bindjan. So I wasn't sure if you were going to see a picture of my face or not. Uh, so I added one in here. This is me dressed up like Ferris the Crab, which is something that I tend to do, particularly when I'm teaching workshops. Uh, but about me, I am on the Rust core team. I am on the Rust uh, WASM working group. I probably am on way more teams than that, but I don't even remember how many teams I'm on now. Uh, but before I came to Rust, I worked in the Node and JavaScript world and was working at their package manager, NPM, which is like vaguely relevant because today we're going to talk a lot about web technologies. So uh, as I mentioned, I am part of this Rust WebAssembly working group, and this is one of the four domain working groups that the Rust team set up for the 2018 edition. Uh, and the goal of these working groups was to create a really awesome kind of seamless developer experience uh, for intermediate developers to have practical applications of Rust, uh, you know, out in the world. Like Rust is super awesome. We tend to have very advanced folks who are working on the language and then very beginner people who are just learning the language. And we really felt like we needed to give something to the middle group. Uh, that being said, I've, I don't know. I, it's weird because I don't know what the audience is like. So I've tried to target the talk at everyone, which inevitably means that at some points you might be bored, some points it might be way over your head. Uh, hopefully it's entertaining either way. Uh, there's a lot of gifts and emoji for the people who want to zone out. Um, yeah, so I'm here to talk to you about this tool called Wasm Bindgen. And I was tweeting about this talk the other day and got this amazing tweet back that said, Wasm Bindgen sounds like a village in Germany, not gonna lie. And this made me laugh. Uh, I really love Berlin and I'm so sad I'm not there right now. I literally want to move to Berlin. But anyways, my friend Emily followed up that she believes that Wasm Bindgen would be kind of like a resort with a spa, like, and she said, ah, oh, yeah, just got back from Wasm Bindgen near Baden-Baden in the Schwarzwald, and I feel so relaxed. Um, maybe you'll feel relaxed after this talk, or maybe you won't. I know I don't feel relaxed right now, uh, but we'll see how it goes. Um, cool. So Wasm Bindgen is a tool that claims to facilitate high-level interactions between Wasm modules and JavaScript. And so that description, like lots of descriptions and answers, but then we're going to go into WebAssembly, flow that the Rust working group and developing for that. And then I'll dive deeper into some web engine features. And at the very end, assuming I have time, I'm going to dive into how does WASM Bindgen even, which is how is WASM Bindgen implemented, um, which is something that I had a lot of fun uh, diving into, uh, but I hopefully won't go too deep. Uh, so yeah, let's get started. What does Wasm Bindgen do? So at the most high level, uh, Wasm Bindgen does two things. It creates a wrapper JavaScript module for your Wasm code so that you can import the Wasm code. And then additionally, it generates bindings for JavaScript to communicate with the Wasm code. And so in this sense, Wasm Bindgen is kind of an unusual Bindgen. 
Uh, and I realize now that since I go first, you don't actually know what a normal bungeon is perhaps, but it's unusual in that it generates bindings for two things to communicate, but neither of those things is Rust, at least not directly. Um, so that's kind of a fun part about this. Uh, so in the room, people hear script, but I cannot see you raise your hands or maybe just the people. Cool. Um, I have to imagine that most people in the room write JavaScript. It's a pretty ubiquitous language these days. If you are on the web, you need to write JavaScript. Uh, and if you aren't on the web, I mean, bless you, that's great, but I don't know how you're pulling that off. Um, cool. So the question here is, why do we have this tool called Lesson Bindgen that is generating all of this JavaScript? And in order to answer why Lesson Bindgen, we're going to have to talk about Web assembly. So again, this is the part of the talk where it'd be like, who here knows what web assembly is? And so maybe some people will know. Um, and especially if there's anybody in the room who's written any web assembly, just that's awesome. Keep writing web assembly. Uh, if you have not written any web assembly, um, hopefully by the end of this talk, you will be motivated to uh, write some. We'll see. All right. So let's get the boring definitions out of the way first. This is the WebAssembly logo. And WebAssembly defines itself as a binary instruction format for a stack-based virtual machine. WASM is designed as a portable target for compilation of high-level languages. <laughs> Lol, like C and C++, really? Uh, high level. Um, yeah, anyways, it's all arbitrary. Anyways, a compilation target for high-level languages like C, C++, and Rust, enabling deployment on the web for client and server applications. So WebAssembly looks like this. Uh, these are two formats because there's all sorts of different ways that you can actually view WebAssembly code. So WebAssembly is an assembly language. And so down here on the bottom, you can see the extremely readable uh, raw kind of WebAssembly output here. Um, obviously, the first line is web, WASM binary magic, uh, so we're starting off very transparent, obviously. Uh, but a lot of people, when WebAssembly first came out, were very concerned that we were going to have a web technology that was not human readable, like you couldn't read source, and that was something that people were really nervous about. And so if that's something you also happen to be nervous about, you should be well aware that there's a lot of uh, human readable uh, versions of WebAssembly. Uh, the one that I have put up here on the top is uh, the S expression syntax or WAST. Uh, and so this is just a, a small example of some WebAssembly that can add two numbers together. Uh, you might notice that the, <laughs> that the syntax looks a bit like Lisp. So if you're one of those people who is like, I want Lisp to win, like maybe it did a little with this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this is the human readable version and there's tons of tooling out there to help you go back and forth between all of the different ways that you can view it. Uh, but like most assembly languages, you can write it on your own, but that doesn't mean that you should. Uh, and so generally, uh, I'm going to be talking about writing Rust that is compiled to WebAssembly. So this is not a talk necessarily about why you should use WebAssembly. If you aren't sold, I can't spend too much time trying to sell you, but there are a couple of reasons why you might be interested in it. So WebAssembly is designed to be a size and load time efficient binary format, which is, especially if you're working on the web is something that's incredibly important. I know we all care about performance. Uh, in addition, uh, because it's able to access some hardware capabilities, it's able to run with somewhat like near native speed. Um, now with all this size, load time and speed stuff, um, performance always depends on how you write it. You can use absolutely super awesome performance technologies to write incredibly slow code. Uh, so again, uh, WebAssembly uh, aims to be small and fast, uh, but of course you have to write it well to get it to do that. Um, a couple of things that people don't necessarily think about when they think about WebAssembly kind of beyond the size and speed parts is that it's uh, a, in a memory safe sandbox execution environment, which is super awesome. So WebAssembly is also quite safe. Uh, and one of the awesome things about it that kind of separates it from predecessors like Knackle or Pnackle or maybe even something like Flash uh, is that WebAssembly is part of the open web platform, which means that it kind of abides by the way uh, all open web platforms do, backwards compatibility, uh, open development, open design. 
Uh, and so if you wanted to join the WebAssembly community group in the W3C, that's something that exists. Uh, and it's really neat to see a technology like this kind of happening right now. WebAssembly is sort of like the first low level language written for the web, which is kind of exciting and special. And I'm obviously very excited about it and hopefully you can be too. Uh, so a lot of people then will ask, okay, well, why Rust and WASM? Like, why is Rust a good candidate to WebAssembly? And a lot of people will ask, like, what can target WebAssembly? Can I compile JavaScript to WebAssembly? Can I compile Ruby or Go to WebAssembly? And the answer is, like, compilers, right? You can compile anything to anything if you try hard enough. Um, but some things are better suited for WebAssembly than others. And so Rust is particularly well suited for compiling WebAssembly because there's no garbage collection or runtime. And if you were to take a language that has garbage collection or a runtime, when you compiled it down to WebAssembly, you would have to include the garbage collector or the runtime in it, uh, which kind of starts negating the whole speed and small elements of WebAssembly. And so mostly, why is it good? No garbage collection or runtime. And then like all the other awesome things about Rust um, kind of make it an amazing target. I like to say like, so in the definition of WebAssembly, we talked about how you could target it with C and C++. Um, I think Web, uh, Rust is better than C or C++ for WebAssembly for all of the reasons that I would recommend a beginner use Rust instead of C or C++. That being said, you absolutely can use uh, C, C++, Go has a garbage collector. There's something called, uh, or not garbage collector, has a way to compile to WebAssembly. Uh, and even JavaScript has something called assembly script, uh, which is a way to get your subset of TypeScript to compile to WebAssembly as well. So there's lots of things that you can use, but I'm on team, Rust should be the thing you choose to compile to WebAssembly. And hopefully at a Rust meetup, lots of you already are on that team as well. All right, so you, if you're in the Rust community, you've probably heard a ton of talk already about WebAssembly because the Rust community is hype about this technology right now. Uh, the thing that might not be entirely obvious is why the Rust community would be so friggin' hype about WebAssembly. So the reason, uh, there's lots of them, but I'm gonna show this as, a, as an example. So this is the module accounts website, if you're curious, and this is comparing uh, our beloved package manager, Crates.io, its registry with the number of its packages, to the package manager I used to work for, for JavaScript called NPM. And what you can see here is that there's so in a practical way web development, the uh, space that we have left to grow is huge. Like this is a huge opportunity uh, for Rust to tap into an area that is gonna see just continued explosive growth. Like the web is not going away uh, and Rust should be a part of it. And so Rust is already a part of it with lots of server-side technologies, but with WebAssembly, we can break into doing stuff on the front end. And just as an insider from NPM, one of the fun facts that very people realize is that more than 80% of the packages on NPM are actually used for front-end development. So server-side development is a thing that people definitely do, but people are really doing a ton of client-side development these days. Uh, and so that ecosystem would be a huge boon for Rust in its adoption process. Cool. So there's kind of a large problem right now, which is, that, uh, and this is the reason why BindGen exists at all, is that currently WebAssembly is a very new technology and WebAssembly can only talk in numbers. It only can call or export functions that deal exclusively with these few uh, number definitions, number types. And so, yeah, you might be saying, well, Ashley, you know, programming is math and you can absolutely do all the programming you need with those types. And like, sure, you're not wrong, but I don't wanna do that at all. <laughs> I'm not interested in that story. That doesn't seem like a fun thing to me. And so the goal of WASM BindGen is to enhance this ABI of WASM modules to have richer types. Um, and so if you're not familiar with the term ABI, it's kind of as opposed to API, which is significantly better well known, um, but ABI stands for Application Binary Interface. And it's an interface between two binary program modules where one is kind of like a library or operating system facility, and then the other is a program that is being written by the user. And so 
WASM and WASM's goal fundamentally is to be the ABI of the web. And, and as it stands, it, it, it really kind of is. The trick is that it's just not complete yet. And it's definitely worth mentioning that a lot of the things I'm talking about right now are truths right now. But all of this is under active development. And so a lot of these things are likely going to change and change not in like the unpredictable, oh no, everything is broken way, change in the, oh my gosh, we don't have to do as much work as we used to to get things to be awesome. So uh, this is really obvious when we can kind of take a look at uh, the grand scheme of how these things are working. And so you can have Rust and you can take Cargo and you can compile your Rust targeting WebAssembly. And then uh, browsers completely understand how to read in that WebAssembly and run it. The real problem comes in if you want to have any sort of JavaScript that talks to that WebAssembly. And that's because in order to talk to that JavaScript, you're gonna have to, be, to have your JavaScript talk to that WebAssembly, you're gonna have to use a language of only numbers. And uh, I know I've been doing JavaScript programming for a long time, but I love to make the joke that web programming is fancy string concatenation. And last I checked, strings aren't numbers, at least not obviously. And while you could convert them, doing that work all the time would be a huge pain in the butt. So what we're able to do with WASM BindGen is this. <laughs> and so we'll dive exactly like way deeper into exactly what is going on here. Uh, but just kind of as a reference, whenever you see the little Ferris with the uh, WASM hard hat on, uh, his double exoskeleton, as it were, uh, that's going to represent WASM BindGen doing some work for us. But fundamentally, what's happening here, as I said before, is that WASM BindGen is going to be writing lots of JavaScript so that you can read your JavaScript into a runtime like the browser or Node. Uh, and you'll be able to interface with your WebAssembly as if it was JavaScript. And so not only the JavaScript generated by WASM BindGen, but any sort of random JavaScript you want is going to be able to talk to this and work seamlessly. All right. So why would we want this? Just as a reminder, like JavaScript and Node in particular, I think, have succeeded because they've been able to make people incredibly productive. Uh, the code is relatively maintainable because it's a high-level language, and it's accessible because people can learn it. And so when we're thinking about developer workflows for WASM and Rust, uh, we also care about these three things. And all of this developer experience has been based on that. So you might be asking, Ashley, this all sounds great. How the heck do I do this? How do I do it? All right. Magic. Yeah, developers don't like magic. I didn't expect y'all to be too excited about that. Don't worry. We're going to talk about all the magic right now. All right. So again, as I said, we're focusing heavily on developer workflows. And we don't want this to be you when you are writing any sort of Rust WebAssembly or JavaScript <laughs> in this whole entire ecosystem. Rather, what we want to aim for is something more like this, where it's like just this intensely coordinated kind of seamless performance. Um, where, you know, maybe five of these dudes are JavaScript developers and two of them are Rust developers and they can just work happily in sync based on this developer workflow we've given them. And this is really important because, and I can't spend enough time on this slide, WebAssembly is not trying to replace JavaScript. Uh, if you heard about WebAssembly and were like, yes, JavaScript will die, uh, you can just head on out now. This is not the room for you, and this is certainly not the presentation. Um, I mean, look at it. Like, I'm talking about this workflow. This is not making JavaScript disappear. This is making a lot of JavaScript. In fact, we are focusing pretty heavily on making JavaScript so that working with JavaScript will work. And I mean, remember that module accounts thing that I showed you? Like, JavaScript's not going away. And a brand new technology that can be targeted by another brand new technology is not going to go walk in and wipe it off the planet. So one, killing JavaScript's not to have it to begin with, but it's also just not realistic. Um, and if we want Rust to succeed and we want WebAssembly to succeed, interoperating with JavaScript is critical. And so that's what this entire workflow has been focused on. So. For the Rust WASM working group, there's tons of use cases for WASM, many of which I won't talk about, but especially the goal of WASM BindGen is that we want to be able to give JavaScript developers the opportunity to surgically replace hot paths in their JavaScript with WebAssembly, which means just a tiny little bit. And for those of you who have ever worked in JavaScript, I'm sure you're familiar with the hot paths that can happen. Anything that's like really processing heavy, 
parsing, all that type of stuff can be incredibly uh, tough on something like JavaScript and can perform rather poorly. In order to get JavaScript to perform well, you might have to, you know, enchant some black magic to get the V8 uh, engine to work on your side. And so that's not good. We've already lost half of our productivity, accessibility, and maintainability goals. Uh, so with WebAssembly, it's a way to kind of speed up the bits of your JavaScript that could use a little bit of speeding up. Uh, and so just as an example, like how is this being used in the real world? Uh, Nick Fitzgerald, who is the lead of the Rust WebAssembly working group, uh, recently, well, I guess not recently at this point, in January, is uh, part of the JS source map. Uh, in orange, you can see the Java station and is the WebAssembly. And while we are here that the WebAssembly is much faster than the JavaScript, I think the more like impressive and fascinating element of this is it's not just faster, it's viable. The, uh, you can see the spread, uh, the measurement is significantly smaller. And uh, this has a lot to do with how WebAssembly is using its memory versus how JavaScript is. And you know, when you remove a garbage collector from your uh, you know, program experience, uh, you can have a lot more predictable um, processing happen. And so this is just one example of, this is happening out in the real world and it's awesome. So uh, I said I was going to tell you how, and I didn't. Uh, so now let's really talk about how you can actually get this done. And we're going to look into some code. All of this code exists on the internet, uh, and so do these slides. And this will all be uh, tweeted out later. Um, and you can get the slide URL at the end of the presentation. All right. So uh, Lynn Clark, who is an amazing artist, has uh, drawn a, several code cartoons about this process. And this is from one of her blog posts. Uh, but here, uh, she kind of gives the top level overview of how we're going to do this. So the first step is to compile. Uh, that's when we use Cargo to compile our Rust to the WASM32 unknown unknown target. Uh, then we have this generate binding step, and that's the step that we'll go deeper in today. Uh, and then packaging step, uh, where we can package up all the code that we can publish it to be like MGM. And then lastly, what you do is you can bundle this up. Um, and be able to use it in a JavaScript application with all the workflows that you're already really familiar with. Um, and again, that's like another goal that we have as a group is that using WebAssembly that's been generated by Rust should basically feel no different than using JavaScript. All right, so let's take a look at some of this code. So because we're focusing on being able to kind of surgically replace a hot path, the code examples that we're focusing on are libraries. And so what you can see here, the first code block we have is a cargo.toml. And so to start the project in your cargo.toml, you'll need to declare that it's a C dialib. Uh, and then you'll also need to add wasm bindgen as a dependency. Uh, wasm bindgen actually has two portions, which we'll talk about later. But the portion we're talking about right now is the wasm bindgen library. So we'll declare a dependency on wasm bindgen in our cargo.toml. And then we'll open up just a really basic lib.rs. Uh, taking a look at this code, if you're not familiar with Rust, you might not know, but the goal of this code is to print out to your screen in an alert box uh, the words hello and then some sort of name that has been passed to this function. So let's take a little bit closer look at what the code is doing here. So uh, currently, the, this entire workflow is dependent on Nightly because there's a bunch of procedural macros that are happening under the hood here. Uh, and uh, you can see this first thing is we're adding this feature flag for use extern macros. Uh, eventually, the goal with Rust 2018 is that everything required for this workflow will be unstable. So you will not need to use these. But if you wanted to try it today or sometime soon, you would still need to use these. Luckily, uh, the feature flags we need to use are down from four to one. Uh, so that's super awesome, and hopefully we won't have to do any more of these kind of incantations in the future. Uh, from there, you can see the extra and create statement, which is also going to go away with the new modules proposal. Uh, but we're just pulling in that wasm bindgen crate, uh, and then we're pulling that stuff into namespace with the use statement. The next two blocks are the parts that are most interesting. Uh, so I'm actually going to do the second block first and then talk about the first one. So what you'll see here first off is that there's this kind of funky hashtag bracket shenanigans. And I say that only because as a teacher of Rust, people, the number one question I get is like, what are those things called? 
And so they are officially called attributes. So every time I try and talk about them, I inevitably say tags. So if you hear me say tag or attribute, that is what I'm talking about. And so uh, we have these two blocks here. Uh, the second block, we are going to use the WASM bindgen attribute to tag a function that is a Rust function that we want our WASM to ex uh, our WASM to export. We want this to be available to JavaScript. And so I define this public function greet, and it takes a name, and then that's just going to call this alert function. And so you might be like, whoa, Ashley, alert. That definitely, definitely only exists in the browser. Um, so this is probably not going to compile. Everything's going to be a little bit upset about this. How is that happening? Uh, and what we're then able to do also with the WASM attribute, WASM bindgen attribute, is this first block where we are writing an extern block. And then inside there, we're going to be putting the kind of type definitions or just we're going to say, hey, we expect that a function called alert that takes a string slice is going to exist in the JavaScript. So in a certain sense, this first block is importing a JavaScript function to our Rust. And the second block is exporting a Rust function to our JavaScript. Now, talking about this is a little bit complicated because it sounds like the Rust is talking to the JavaScript. But in no way is that actually happening. Um, instead, we're kind of exporting a WASM function, which has been generated by Rust, and we are importing a JavaScript function to that so that it knows to expect it and can call it out in the JavaScript. So this is the basic code you would need to write in order to do a library. There's a whole bunch of other features I'll talk about in a bit, but this is the basic step. So if you wanted to write a WASM package for NPM, you would start with this. Your next step would be to install this tool called WASMPack, which is the tool that I work on primarily. And WASMPack is kind of this integrated workflow tool that kind of takes care of everything for you. So many of the steps that I'm going to cover today are actually things that WASMPack is just going to handle for you. Uh, but it's worth kind of calling out what it does right now. So WASMPack is a CLI tool distributed uh, via Cargo, um, for better or worse. Uh, and it has a function uh, called init. And you can call wasmpack init in the root directory of your crate, and it's going to do a bunch of stuff for you. The first thing it will do is add the wasm target if you don't have it. It will compile your wasm, uh, your Rust to wasm, uh, and then it's going to create a package directory where it's going to make a package.json for you. It's going to copy over a readme, and then it's going to install a second version of wasm bindgen, the wasm bindgen CLI. And then it's going to run that for you. And in the end, what you end up with is this directory that's called pkg. And inside there is something that is publishable to npm. And so you can run wasmpack publish to take the output of that, uh, of that process and publish it right up to uh, npm. And so clearly, uh, here today, I'm announcing the next most popular module, Hello Wasm. Uh, when it has one weekly download, it's very popular. Um, but this is a, an example of that Hello World uh, library being published up to WebAssembly. Uh, once you've been able to publish up to NPM, uh, you can now consume this from any type of web application that you might be used to. So this is an example that uses Webpack, which is a popular uh, bundler for JavaScript. And uh, what I'm able to do here is just list that npm package that I published as a dependency and, uh, my dependency and then call the greet function with the word wasm. Uh, and when I run that in my browser, I will get this lovely alert box that says hello wasm, just like that. Um, so this is obviously a naive example. But I like to show this because I want to show that it's right there. It's something that you can So hopefully what you can see here is there is a future where people are depending on NPM packages that have WebAssembly inside, and they don't even have to know. Um, this is really the goal, that it just kind of magically happens and people have no idea that kind of under the hood uh, some of these packages contain WebAssembly. The interoperability should be such that it's not something that you have to think about. 
Uh, and it turns out that uh, we've done very good at getting that done. However, it is definitely a complicated process and the WASM bind gen tool is doing a lot of heavy lifting for you uh, on the inside. Let's talk about what just happened in that hello world example. All right, so this is uh, just a shot of my terminal. And so the, we're in a directory called crate, which just has a very, the very basic kind of rust uh, hello world library in there. And then we can just peek inside our PKG directory and we can see all of the files that got generated for us. So in here we have a readme, really not too interesting, package.json, which is kind of just the JSON version of your cargo toml with some other stuff in it. Uh, but the other files are the really interesting bits. And so the three things I want to point out here are the hello wasm underscore bg dot wasm file, hello underscore wasm dot t dot ts file, and hello wasm dot js file. Uh, so the WASM file is a somewhat modified version of the WebAssembly file that Cargo generated for us. Something that's kind of interesting about WASM bind gen is that it kind of holds the opinion that the WebAssembly that is generated by Cargo is kind of incorrect. Um, but we'll talk about exactly why and how in a second. Um, but then the JavaScript file is our wrapper module for that WebAssembly. Uh, and it's also going to contain a whole bunch of binding functions, which allow us to interact with the functions that are exported by the WebAssembly. Uh, but instead of having to use just number types, we're able to use a rich set of types that we're used to in JavaScript. Rich set of types in JavaScript is a, not something I would ever expect to say, um, but it's certainly richer than what is in WebAssembly. Um, yeah. And then lastly, I think something that is really quite fun is that because we are talking in a, a type language here, uh, we're able to generate a, a types definition for TypeScript for you just automatically, just like, just in case you want it. And even if you're not a TypeScript developer, uh, this can be really awesome for a whole bunch of your dev developer tools. Um, they're able to, you know, do code completion and a whole function lookups and all sorts of things using this type file. So that's pretty great. Um, so because I am a visual learner, I did my best to try and draw a diagram of this, uh, but <laughs> It's a little complicated, uh, but we can just kind of talk through that again, and I'll talk a little bit more um, uh, in specifics here. So the first step is we have the cargo build step where we're going to be targeting WebAssembly. And so this is not purely just, you know, targeting WebAssembly because we have included the WASM bind gen library and we've annotated uh, several functions with that WASM bind gen attribute. And WASM bind gen library has a ton of procedural macros in it. And so before it actually ends up targeting WebAssembly, uh, it's going to generate a whole bunch of Rust code in addition to the Rust code that you wrote uh, so that the next steps are going to be a lot easier to do. And so I called this the proc macro step um, because I didn't know what else to call it. Uh, but so the first step again is we're going to be targeting WebAssembly, but the, we're already having uh, WASM bind gen generating a bunch of Rust for you. This is the one time that WASM bind gen is writing Rust. Uh, but the goal of it writing Rust is functionally so that you can have WebAssembly that is going to be a lot happier uh, talking to JavaScript in the future. So this. The next step is in this rhombus looking shape here. Uh, and you can see that WASM bind gen makes another magical appearance. Uh, and so what WASM bind gen is able to do now is it's, it's going to look directly at the generated web assembly. So oh. it's worth noting that when the WASM bind gen CLI is running, it's not actually looking at your Rust at all. It's just looking at the generated web assembly. And so it's going to look inside the generated web assembly for this WASM bind gen attribute. Now, of course, it's not going to be written out like this, like the WASM bind gen attribute, but you can understand that within the WebAssembly that has been compiled, um, there are sections within that WebAssembly that have been specifically called out um, using this attribute. And so they're, they're kind of labeled there so that the WASM bind gen CLI can see them. And so once the WASM bind gen CLI is able to see those, what it's going to do is it's going to then be able to write function wrappers, class wrappers, those binding elements so that uh, you can kind of preserve the uh, type signatures of the things that you are trying to interact with. And it's going to generate JavaScript that does that for you. 
Then what it's going to do is it's going to clean up after itself. Because remember, WebAssembly, we want it to be small. We want it to be fast. On the web, being small is part of being fast. And so all the little notes that it left for itself in that WebAssembly, it's going to clean those up. And then it's going to create a new WebAssembly that doesn't have all of that shenanigans in it. Um, and that is going to be what is imported by the JavaScript module wrapper. Um, and so at a very high level, I mean, maybe it's a little bit lower level. It's hard to say. Um, that is what the WESM bind gen CLI is doing. And so what you end up getting generated is a nice cleaned up WebAssembly file, this amazing JavaScript file, which imports that WebAssembly for you and gives you all of these awesome type signature wrappers so that you can interact with the WebAssembly on your terms, not WebAssembly's terms, uh, and then that TypeScript file there. All right. So there's kind of two things here just to kind of review. So there's two elements to WASM bind gen. The first is the WASM bind gen attribute. And this attribute is really just for marking the interface touch points that you want in your Rust, where either you're importing JS classes or functions or you're exporting Rust classes and functions. The second part is the WASM bind gen CLI. And I'm very purposely not really going too deep into what the WASM bind gen CLI does because ideally you don't have to worry too much about it. Um, but what the CLI is going to do at a high level is it's going to use those attributes, the little notes it left in the compiled WebAssembly, to be able to generate those really nice JS bindings for you. All right. So now that I've talked a little bit about what WASM bind gen does and to a certain extent how it does it, you might be asking, okay, what can I do? Like, what, what is supported? And the caveat that I'll give you right now is I'm definitely not going to exhaust all the things you can do with WASM bind gen in this talk. It's simply not long enough and I've already been blabbing on for quite some time. Um, but I want to give you a hint at some of the really cool things it can do. Uh, this question is always really common when you're talking about any sort of FFI, like what is supported, like what is not? Um, and so just to explicitly call out some things that you can't do right now, uh, Wasm bind is going to ignore lifetime shenanigans, it's going to ignore threads, it's going to ignore generics. There's no support for those things at the moment. Um, instead, uh, the vast majority of what I'm going to do is uh, talk a little bit about how you can use if you're really a functional programming language and are really bummed about object-oriented programming, a lot of the features I'm about to share with you are probably not going to be something you're excited about. Um, but it turns out a lot of people on the web really like object orientation. And so a lot of the things I'm going to talk about are about that. So the first one is constructors. So uh, you can actually be able to declare constructors uh, either if you're exporting a Rust function or importing a JavaScript one. Um, so if you want Rust to be able to instantiate a JS class, uh, you can take a look at this first block. And uh, as you can see from our previous example, the WASM bind gen on top of the extern block. But then inside the extern block, we have something kind of interesting going on here. First, we declare a type, which is shoes. Uh, and then we uh, declare a function. So we say fn new returns a shoes object. And we annotate this with an attribute, the WASM bind gen attribute. But you'll see that we pass uh, parentheses to that. And through it, we give it the identifier constructor. And a lot of the features that I'm going to talk about here are going to show up in this way as uh, keywords that we're going to be adding to this attribute. And so if you use this attribute uh, when you are kind of declaring or importing a JavaScript class, um, you'll be able to use this stuff inside your Rust by saying something like let shoes equals shoes colon colon new. Now, similarly, if we go from the other direction, uh, we can also be able to kind of tell our JavaScript um, that if we want to be able to instantiate a Rust or WebAssembly class um, in our JavaScript, uh, we can do something like this. So we can create a struct called foo and annotate it with the WASM by Gen attribute. Uh, and then we can implement some stuff on foo, and we can implement a new function. And if we annotate that function with the WASM bind gen attribute and pass in constructor, uh, we'll be able to call JavaScript like this. So we can import our WASM module, uh, and then we'll be able to say use new space foo. 
like exactly the way you would be able to, you would expect that you would be able to use a class in JavaScript. Uh, additionally, I don't know if you could see, but we respect impl blocks. So here we're implementing a function get contents on our foo struct. And if we construct uh, or instantiate uh, a foo object in our JavaScript after it's been exported like this, we can also call that uh, implemented method get contents on the instantiated class as if it were just a normal class like anything else. Um, similarly, kind of like as I just said, uh, we can very specifically uh, pull methods in uh, to Rust. So if we are importing a JavaScript function to Rust, uh, and we want to say that this class has this method, uh, we can use a similar attribute to what we saw before, but instead of passing in the word constructor, we can pass in the word method. Uh, and as a result, we can see here, we have a type set, which has a method has. Uh, we can instantiate set uh, and then call set.has, and it should work uh, as you expect. Lastly, and this is a little bit more funky, um, we also have kind of recently implemented the ability to understand some class hierarchy and inheritance, uh, which is, again, if you are a functional purist, this probably makes you quite upset. Uh, but here it is anyways, because it's incredibly useful, particularly for writing U uh, UIs and stuff. Um, so here uh, you can use uh, that same Wasenbindgen attribute, except you can pass in the keyword extends, and then you can set it to another JS uh, thing that you are importing. So here we have a type foo, and then we want to say that type bar extends type foo, uh, and we can annotate it just like that, as you can see on the slide. Uh, and this is going to do all of the trait implementation shenanigans under the hood for you, so that these will uh, behave as you would expect. So here's that stuff happening, and then um, you could continue to do this. This goes as far as you would like it to go. So you can say that it both extends foo and it extends bar uh, all the way through like that. Um, one of the reasons I like calling this out is just because if you are interested in this and this tends to be the thing that people have opinions on, um, Wasm Bindgen uh, runs as an open project and we accept RFCs. And so you should definitely keep an eye out for those. Uh, this was an RFC on single inheritance and casting uh, that we recently had merged, which is pretty cool. Uh, and you should check that out. There's all sorts of different features like this for Wes and Bindgen that you can use. Um, so you can check out our documentation if you're interested in more of those different types of features. All right. So one of the things that you might be thinking of is, wow, having to import all the JavaScript that I want to use uh, is a huge pain in the butt. One of the nice things about the web is like a whole bunch of that stuff is just there. Um, strong agree. Uh, we think that that's cool. And so as a result, um, the team has come up with two crates. Uh, one is released and one is like about to be released. Uh, and we call them JSSys and WebSys. Uh oh. Yeah. Is there um, an issue? I'm going to have to time check you for like, I'm sorry, oh, no. but like. We do have a schedule, so uh, that's fair. Uh, we can probably give you like five more minutes. That's, that's fine. Right. I will finish in five. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Sorry. Yeah. No worries. Sorry, I'm babbling on forever. Uh, anyways, JSS, WebSys. JSS is awesome. Uh, it's going to give you all the global APIs that are guaranteed to exist in every JavaScript environment by the ECMAScript standard. Um, this means that you don't have to do extern blocks to pull those things in. So in this example, you'll see that we're using uh, array and we're using date and we aren't going to have to write an extern block for those. We're able to just pull in the crate and that is taken care of for us. Uh, additionally, WebSys is going to be able to do that for all of the web APIs that you would expect um, in the browser. And an awesome thing about WebSys is that it's completely mechanically generated uh, by uh, this awesome thing called WebIDL, which if you are not familiar with, you should give it a look. Um, and I've put a link here. So we are not going to talk about how all of this happens under the hood, but you're lucky because all of it is written down in this amazing guide. Uh, so if you're interested in how all of this memory is managed under the hood, you can take a look at that. But fundamentally, my message to you is the best part about Wasm is that you really don't have to worry about how it works. It just does.
um, and that's really cool. So again, you can learn more, and if you're interested in getting involved, you can join the Rust Wasm Working Group. We've got a ton of different ways to get involved, from writing docs to writing some really cool, bonkers JavaScript. Uh, yeah, so thanks. Thank you so much, Ashley, and sorry we had to kind of cut you short there, but Sorry, like I always go too long. <laughs> okay. Um, what we can do, though, is we can take one or two questions. So we have, like, a portable mic. Yeah, that's like a cube, and we throw it to whomever wants to ask a question. So do we have any questions? Okay. Um, wait, I'm just going to throw it to you. So you just speak in at the top, Ian. All right. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, is there any part of the uh, sort of the ABI extension that has a a significant performance cost associated with it? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so like the crossing of nearly any boundary, um, there are costs involved. Um, uh, in the presentation, uh, what happened to the hood for short-lived uh, Rust WebAssembly, um, like handling short-lived JavaScript objects, um, and so that tends to be a better thing to do. But there's not a particular feature so much as I would say avoid crossing the boundary a lot. Uh, I know this is kind of banal advice, um, but boundaries are expensive. So uh, it's often best if, you know, hopping back and forth is not something that you do very often. But being able to have the JavaScript call into the WebAssembly, do a whole bunch of stuff, and then hop back instead of constantly going back and forth. And then ideally manipulating, you know, objects that you don't need to live long. Like if you adjust to the length of the function you're calling, uh, that's going to be a lot easier, the hood, and as a result, uh, than, than some data object you want to persist past the function. Right. Okay. Um, Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. This limitation to those four different numerical types um, is this a temporary uh, limitation, or is this going to be extended to like UDF8 strings and stuff at some point? Yeah, so um, by all the knowledge that I currently have, it is temporary. Um, I do know that the reason WebAssembly is successful and I think will continue to be successful is because it's incredibly small. Um, but I know that there is a desire to add more types. Now, obviously, that begs the question, well, which ones and how many? And there's actually kind of like some, some heated debate around that uh, because of the desire to keep the spec small. Uh, so, but yeah, I would say in general, we should expect that the set of types that WebAssembly can use will grow, uh, though the direction of that is definitely still being figured out at the moment. Is that Till? That is Till. <laughs> Hi, Till. <laughs> And this is not a question, but probably UTF-8 strings are not easy because JavaScript PMs use UTF-16, which kind of sucks. But I, I would <laughs> do it later. Later, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, just throw it. Oh Jesus! Okay. Um, thank you so much, Ashley. So we are going. Yeah, one more round of applause. Yeah. Feel free to ping me on Twitter or ask any other questions. Um, but yeah, thanks, y'all. <laughs> Bye. OK, um, we're just going to, I don't know. I don't know how to switch the screens right now. So we're going to have a little short 10 minute break. Uh, the important thing that I want to talk about is the toilets, because they're not there. They are 
you see these stairways on the side there? There's a stairway, and if you go up and then to the right, there's the toilets. Because of security reasons, we can't use those. So we're going to have a 10-minute break. Yeah, that's, that's the office. Um, we're going to have a 10-minute break. And then after that, we're going to continue on with the second talk. So grab something to drink, get a bit of relatively fresh air, and we'll meet back here. Hello. We want to continue. So, with Ashley gone, we're now going to talk about the first spine gen, the Rust spine gen by Emilio, who was already done with the talk by Monday, but no one showed up on Monday, so he's yeah. doing it now. <laughs> so, yeah, Emilio, Rust spine gen. Okay. So a quick disclaimer, I'm not so good as a speaker as Ashley is, so this talk, this talk is probably going to be like shorter and you're free to interrupt me and ask questions, uh, whatever. Uh, and yeah, I guess I should just keep going. Um, so who, how many of you are familiar with Raspberry Engine and like have done some FFI with C stuff? Okay, that's a few. Uh, Anyway, so Rust provides a lot of, well, first, let me introduce myself, otherwise it's going to look weird. <laughs> um, so my name is Emilio, I work on Firefox, I work mostly on the layout engine and the style engine, which was recently rewritten in Rust, uh, pulling stuff from Servo. Um, that's pretty much it, that's what I do. <laughs> but I also do like a couple other things like Bindian or like the code indexer that we use for Firefox that indexes REST code and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, I'm Emilio on IRC. I'm, my Twitter handle is, and Emilio on GitHub as well, and my Twitter handle, I can't even write it. So, um, okay. So what does Bindian do? So it generates definitions for C and C++ objects and functions uh, so that you can, as long as you link to the C, uh, program, you can call it from Rust, and it's useful when you don't write, want to, I don't know, rewrite your own crypto, or you mentioned before. Uh, it basically generates given C code like this, uh, which is like uh, bislib, uh, it generates equivalent Rust declarations like this. It's not the most beautiful Rust code you've ever seen, I, but it works. Um, so, it also works with C++, with a tiny disclaimer, which is like C++ turns out to be hard. Uh, <laughs> it's very annoying, but it works enough for like Firefox, so it may be good enough for you too if you have a C++ project. It's like the standard library could get some love and like, but it works. So it works with templates like this, uh, and, like code like this, it generate Rust code like, oh, screen, fun. It will generate Rust code like this, with like all the members and phantom types and like the correct link names so that you can call them. Uh, if you're binding with C++, yeah, it's not beautiful, but it does work. Uh, so if you're binding with C++, you probably want to run Bindian at build time. There's multiple ways to, well, this is the C++ caveats just a disclaimer, there's no virtual functions because nobody has gotten around to figure out what's the right Vtable layout because C++ compilers differ. So it's probably a very fun project to work on, but yeah, I, I'm happy to like mentor and contribute to implement this, but I don't think I have the time for myself to do that. Then templates can get hard. If you have like, if you know a bit of C++, you can like do template specialization where you the type layout changes depending on which type parameter, so it, not everything is so simple like the type I put there. So we sometimes need to fall back to uh, just opaque blobs, just like this type, which would be like a vector of foo and with a type of, with a template parameter of two, then it's just like a blob of like two U64s that has the right alignment or, and size. Uh, so 
since C++ is so ugly and binding with C++ is so, such a pain, uh, we have a lot of control to get to control what's generated so that you can actually get something to work out and be nice. Now, there's multiple ways to use Bindium if you want to like bind to a different library. Uh, Bindium was born as a CLI tool, so you could just like cargo install Bindium and then run it on visit lib and you suddenly you have like a Rust file you can import from somewhere and you can use. It's nice because like it's fast, like binding in release mode is pretty fast. It avoids slower build times because when, if you have binding as a dependency and you're doing a debug build, which is what you usually do to like develop your program, it turns out that you need to run binding of debug on debug mode because Cargo doesn't allow you to run some build dependencies on release mode, which means that it takes a bit. Uh, but it's also slightly easier to shoot yourself in the, in the food, that is, if somebody, like if the C code you're binding to has like if devs depending on the platform or just like the crazy stuff that people do in C and C++, uh, then suddenly like you have a problem if somebody uses your program with your Rust bindings for Linux in Mac OS or vice versa. The nicer way to, to do it is via build.rs where you can like just pull bind them as a build dependency and tell it which headers you want to generate uh, and they use like the system clang to don't use a star as a dependency, but <laughs> other than that, it's fine. Uh, so you just pull bind them and tell it, okay, just like generate bindings for visit live and you just write it into the cargo output directory. I don't know how many of you are familiar with cargo build scripts, but cargo has this nice setup where you can like write into this out there environment variable. You can drop whatever file you want there, and you can basically pull in from your Rust source just like using like include and compat. So in your Rust code, you would have something like this, um, and you would be able to access all the bindings from there. Now, okay, so there's people that have very strong, very strong opinions about Binion. Binion sometimes rocks because it's very easy to use for C. But if you're doing C++ stuff, it can suck quite a bit. But the upshot is like, I'm like, you're totally encouraged to contribute and join and like help out with documentation, writing code. I'm super happy to let other people do this work. <laughs> uh, so docs kind of suck because like whenever somebody adds an API, we add docs, but they document like with the perspective of the guy that writes the API, which so they know the use case and blah, blah. So improving docs, if you find something unclear when you use Pinyon is like really encouraged. We have like a book where, and then there's docs rs with the API. Uh, the book should, has like a very nice tutorial on how to get it set up and like mine to like stuff. Uh, then there are, a lot of tiny fixes that could be done to bind you and that are just like someone needs to like write test cases, uh, write the code. There's like from API additions that are not like that are not great now, or like support wrapper transparent, which was just something stabilized, or basically everything tagged with help wanted, or everything not tagged with help wanted. Uh, and if you happen to use Bindion and you're blocked on something and suddenly like everything you like are doing depends on like this type layout, which happens to be wrong, uh, then I, I'm i happy to take a look and fix as soon as, as possible or help out fixing it. Now there are way bigger and funnier projects if you're into that kind of stuff. Uh, if you want to support inline functions, so Binion generates the type declarations, but you need to, actual, to actually have the compiled C++ code or C code into your binary. So you need to link it and it has to and inline functions don't have that, right? Like they get in line in the function that calls them. So there's someone proposed a pretty crazy thing, which uh, actually would work, which is like, if you're familiar with C to Rust, which is basically an automatic C to Rust translator. Okay, it was obvious on, anyway, on retrospective. <laughs> but uh, if you're into that, uh, you could basically auto-generate the C functions in Rust and just add the inline attribute and you could use them the same way. 
You could also support C++ methods. I suspect the easy cases should be mostly straightforward. Like then, like when you start getting into like virtual destructors and overloads and crazy stuff, compilers differ, and if you build with MSVC, you're screwed. Uh, bit fields stuff. Bit fields are a kind of worms. I don't know if you know about C++ bit fields, but you can basically specify a bit width on a member of, in C++ and you basically access it as if it was an actual member, but it's a few bits under the hood. They are hard. Um, and also, you could also, one of the nastiest things of Bindian is that we use the C API that Clang provides called libclang, uh, which basically is a very high level API that exposes some parts of the AST but not all, which means that when you get uh, into complex C++ code, we just like have to make guesses and we just sometimes bail out because we like it's not exposed, whatever we are trying to generate. So we just like figure. Uh, any questions, do it now or either like while I'm at it. Uh, I, don't I don't know where to keep the cube. Okay. <laughs> um, I was wondering, um, does, um, does it support macros? So does it translate macros to Rust macros? Well, it does. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer is it depends. It does support like macros that uh, end up evaluating to a constant. Like if you do like hash define foo, force define foo, and, and mathematically that depends on our couple macros, that will work. Functional macro, like bar arcs macro. I mean, that, that project, if you want to try, uh, probably hard because, like, well, Rust macros are hygienic. I never know how to pronounce that word. Uh, and C macros are C macros. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Any other question? Sorry. <laughs> okay. What about data types like in, in C, like uh, socket, socket definitions, socket type definitions? Those? They are using unions, and uh, so they might have uh, different representations internally, depending on what kind of socket you're creating. So how is... I'm, I mean, it will basically mimic the, uh, the actual C definition of the type, right? So if you have like a union with like different kinds of sockets, it would generate either a Rust union or a hacky thing we had before union existed, <laughs> uh, depending on what whether you tell Binion to generate Rust unions or not. But it basically it doesn't generate any nice API for that, but it does generate the correct type layout, so you can poke at it as you would in C, and then you would probably have like some helper functions that expose mm. something sane out of it. Um, one of the things that, um, like, so the usual th way to use Bindgen is, as you saw before, Ashley mentioned like the JS slash sys uh, and JS and web dash sys. Uh, those crates are basically what you do when you have like FFI stuff to just provide the definitions, like the thing that Bindgen generates in a sys crate, and then you provide a nicer Rusty API on top of that using that as a dependency. And yeah, so for sockets, you could provide like a raw socket. Oh, well, this is super loud. Is that better? Thank you. <laughs> uh, so uh, for sockets, you would provide like a, I don't know, socket dash space API, like a crate, and then like an API on top of that, which has like nice uh, Rust types that wrap those and like mm -hmm. call the underlying system library. Okay, thank you. No worries. Any other? Okay. So it's my first time doing something like live coding in the stage. So if I mess it up, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it sounded like fun. Uh, so. Okay. That's not what it's supposed to look. Anyway, so the. So the thing we're going to find to is this magic guy. Uh, it's a PHP file. Of course, it's a PHP file. No, but I mean, are you binding to a PHP file? <laughs> <laughs> oh, definitely. No, you can do it. Well, yeah, so apparently, plus, then I guess PHP is a piece of cake. <laughs> and no internet. Great. <laughs> 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 
That's gonna help. That should help. Can I get up to them again? Or no. Yeah. Did you remember to sacrifice a goat this morning? <laughs> uh, I'm. I mean, I'm actually surprised that I can't project because we really left. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So we're going to do basically this, which is like a API that exposes image magic. This program, for example, just like it's a very simple C program that resizes. Oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> oh. OK, it's a very simple C program, which takes an image as an argument and resizes it and creates a thumbnail uh, using image magic. And I'm not into image decoding and encoding, so I don't want to write that in Rust. There's probably nice Rust crates for this, but since this is a binding talk, I'm not going to use those. Uh, but yeah, so we're going to generate image magic bindings. Let's see. Great. OK. That's, those are my speaker notes. So I have a empty cargo project here. And let me try to get my display also so I don't break my neck. And no. <laughs> it worked for a bit. I look here. It's up there. Oh, okay. Oh, it's no, 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 no. It's straight. It's there. No. So the issue is that my so I have two screens and one of them is that one. Anyway, that should work. If I'm amazing. Uh, yeah. Okay. So hopefully, if I can see it over there, you can see it as well. <laughs> so I'm going to just like init a very simple cargo project. And so the way we're going to do it is like package config magic wand. I have it installed. You can install it via like Fedora or whatever. Um, so we're going to pull bind gen. I don't know which version it is. Let's use the star. <laughs> yeah, just use star. Is it a bit dependency? That should work. And then like. So bind gen is a build dependency. We probably also want like. PKJ config because it's going to do the nasty stuff of actually going find the headers. And if I have internet, it may work. Same what? Oh, oh, good point. <laughs> I don't know which version package config is. Star. Star all the things. <laughs> <laughs> Anti patterns on stage. <laughs> I accounted with a bit better internet here. And oh, it has recommendations for like PKJ. Yeah, I mean, worst case, I have a branch here with the whole thing. So worst case, I can just go through. But that was this, this one. <coughs> what? Oh, yeah. Is it, is it off? Or? You should be okay. Yeah. yeah, if I turn it on. OK. So. Okay, we have our dependencies. We're going to add like. <laughs> Debugging build is fun. <laughs> so if everything actually goes well. We should see something on the screen with the magic wand stuff. Dun, 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 dun. 
Yeah, in retrospect, I could have pulled the dependencies before. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah, so we have like the library, the like, and like the frameworks and the includes and the defines, blah, blah, blah. Nice. So now. Works. Yeah, I'm. Question. <laughs> uh, I don't know where the cube went. Uh, so, does this require the development headers on the machine building the library? Yes. That sucks. Like yes. But on the other hand, like yes. Yeah, so you can generate the static bindings, which for well-defined APIs like this is probably a better fit. But for stuff that you want to like either change or that have like platform dependent defines or stuff like that. Uh, it's probably better to just like, especially if you know that it, they are going to be installed, like if you're like doing like Linux development or whatever, or it doesn't matter. Uh, Yeah, the fancy essence there. There's no more to complete now. <laughs> <laughs> and also, no, just use my PKE config thing. Hmm? How to just directly get all the like parts of the PKE? No, but that's a very good API addition. <laughs> I wish I had thought of that. Um, yeah, This is totally not nice error handling. <laughs> so are you writing to the target directory now? What? Are you writing to the target directory now? Um, yeah, so I'm going to, like, basically this tells it, okay, so you're going to generate a header that has basically include the header we want to bind to. Um, we want to, like, use this system includes that we got from package config, and we want to write to out there and and whatever bindings dot rs file we yeah. then from your source, source code you would be able to reference that right so from your source code you can include uh, i will do that in a second so simply similar to contract generation and work flows uh, i don't know about contract generation like but similar um serialization stuff yeah yeah so i guess yeah if yeah. he says so i'll <laughs> <laughs> It's building, it's doing stuff. <laughs> it's running bind gen on debug mode, which is the crappy thing I talked about. <laughs> like, <laughs> cargo, cargo build the stash release would be very nicer. And now, if I remove the panic, it would be much better.
So blah, blah, blah. We, we could define our stuff here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like we could alter the header contents to contain the defines that package config gives us, but they probably have something seen. <laughs> like C code doesn't follow very rusty naming conventions. So why don't you allow the same? Huh? Why 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 the in in general allow the same that it knows? So because you don't know how like Binion doesn't know how what you're going to do with it, right? Like you could put it in a module, or you can like concatenate different binding files together, and then like if Binion itself use. Like you can actually add the yellow itself. Like Binion has, as I said, a lot of like APIs to change. I don't know. You could say <clears throat> if you know it's going to be a module, you could do like this. Binion could try to detect the warnings, but since Rust is very warning happy sometimes, and like it, we will probably rewrite all the um, Rust diagnostics. So. Right. Yeah, you could. You could. If you run it beforehand, you could. Uh, right. You could use just mod bindings, and but in practice, there was a time where like Rusty would not display diagnostics in these files, which would kind of suck. But mm, and I don't know the magic wand API. Let's try this. <laughs> Will it go faster in the dash release? Yeah. But then like all the dependencies would take forever to to build because it's a release build. That's why I would encourage you to go to that cargo issue and like give a thumbs up to let Rust build build dependencies. Every time? Just know the no, yeah. So, so this is it's generating a bunch of like FP stuff, which I don't know what it is. But anyway, we're going. Yeah, clearly. Uh, so I hope it's not it's because sure like yeah but I, but yeah but I hope it's not image magic because then like I'm screwed. No. <laughs> oh. uh, <laughs> We're going to just generate whatever we want to generate instead of. <laughs> hey, and it does something, Ooh, and it, it doesn't crash. <laughs> yeah, and it even has like so. Bindian generates tests for the to ensure that the C and uh, and Rust layouts match. So if you run cargo test and something fails, then like something's going wrong <laughs> and you should file it back. But yeah, so that's pretty much it. I <laughs> and, um... look at all this code magically appeared. <laughs> <laughs> And well, yeah, whatever. So this is the actual thing where you can like, it's slightly nicer, still not great, but that's like an actual cargo, like an, an actual Rust program with takes arguments and uses clap for parsing them, blah, blah, blah. It was like a very simple rewrite of the C program. 
which is still nicer than writing C, in my opinion. But anyway, so that's pretty much it. I don't know if uh, you have any other questions that may have come up or uh, just whatever. I'll try to not drop water here. Um, yeah. Is there any other question or whatnot? Oh, okay. How does the error handling work in terms of something goes out? And... Whoa, whoa. <laughs> Sorry. How does the error handling work if something goes out? I mean, try, the C program tries to access to the out of scope memory or something. What happens to Rust? It's C. So. Would it panic or you can catch it? Or I mean, no, you can't panic. Like the C code writing into random places because the C code is compiled in C. Mm -hmm. So so there's basically, when you call into FFI, that's why it's an unsafe call. You don't get the memory safety guarantees that Rust provides. But there's still like a lot of C code out there, which is <laughs> unfortunate, but true. <laughs> so I saw you um, global magic wand initialize or whatever it was called, uh, Genesis. Um, how do you free those resources? Is there? Um... So you like there's a in C, you're supposed to call like magic wand terminus, apparently. And all these calls are leaking all that because they exit. So all this code that called throw throw one exception, whatever, they get leaked in the rest program I wrote, then like you actually have this thing that just after calling initialized, you like have this that on drop uh, mm -hmm. calls the terminus and freeze okay. the memory. But yeah. Uh, now that you just mentioned it, how do you handle uh, exceptions? Like C plus plus exceptions, <laughs> <laughs> or like. There was some throw statement in the in the magic. Uh, oh stuff. well, it's still C, so they are just like function calls, like magic get exception, or magic relinquish memory. So when, if there is an error here, I'm going to leave it building. Uh, so if there's an error here. Seriously. Uh, so here, for example, I have this get exception that whenever an error happens, you just return an error result, which is an own string, and just like and this program just panics, right? But you get the error message. So, for example, if you do, I don't know if it ended the building. Yay! So if you do this. Um, a file that doesn't exist and that's not okay. Yeah, so you get like the actual error from whatever, yeah, blob.c open blob 2761. Do you have a facility for C exceptions? You wish. <laughs> <laughs> like, so, so it hasn't come up because. Firefox and every other big C++ project I know compiles without exceptions. We just don't need it. Uh, Katharina is doing something which is like black magic that allows you to catch Rust exceptions, like C++ exceptions from Rust and blah, blah, blah. I, I don't want to spoil that. But, uh, but anyway, the point is, no, if you C++, like if Rust code, it's the same that what happens if you have like C++ code which calls into Rust code and you panic and you don't have like panic equal support. And like during the UB territory, probably something happens. <laughs> it, it would probably not in, eat your land tree, but it could. <laughs> but yeah, C is not the greatest. Like bindings, like there's all this, like this ABI, like target dependent ABI stuff, which is pretty nasty. But so, any other question? There. What in C++, if you have a function that takes a class, mm -hmm. and then usually this needs to, to be constructed. So you have to manually call the destructor, call the constructor, call everything, or? So uh, that's something that for, for which we do uh, have some. Um, so the best way to check this is going to the binding, the binding tests. And um, 
it works, but virtual methods don't, which is the annoying thing. We do generate B tables because it's necessary to like have the right size and stuff. And we do understand inheritance to some extent. We don't add any fancy stuff. But yeah, this like we have methods, we have constructors, we generate bindings for the structures as well. Uh, we don't automatically implement drop for them, so you need to manually call it because if you implement drop for multiple things and the C++ destructors also distracts them, you're like double freeing stuff, which is not fun. <laughs> uh, so you need to actually take care of that. But yeah, we do generate. And when you call when you call a function that takes a class which needs to be destructed, um, so and one of the arguments of the function is is a string, for example. Yes. So. It depends on what it's your binding with C++, so it depends on what the C++ code does. There's no lifetimes here. Yes. So, so, you, so you have first to construct the string, then right. you pass the string to the function. For example, yeah. So, so for this magic one stuff, you, uh, so you use the normal FFI APIs, which take like a siester and just like you turn the Rust string uh, into a C string and then you pass it down. But then like the, depending on what the contract is with that particular function, then like you may need to forget the string and just like let the C code free it, assuming they share the same allocator and stuff. That's a standard string, for example. Huh? As, as STD string. Oh, an STD string. <laughs> so then yes, you would need to construct an STD string, which is kind of annoying. Or you could just like write code that takes a car star and then or something, mm -hmm. which is probably easier. Yeah, but you don't choose what the library has. Right, but you can still write like wrapper code. So for Firefox, we have a lot of C++ code, uh, but, the, but the functions we call are usually like pretty simple that just like take pointers and stuff. And then like we have like those functions get compiled into the binary as well and called into the API turning into like strings or whatnot. So it depends on what you're trying to do. But yeah, we don't have, so one of the other nice things to do would be to have like proper C++ standard library support, which. Because also the problem is that std string cannot be moved in memory. Right, because it has like tiny, yeah, stack stuff. Yeah, like C++, but yeah, generally you could construct a string in memory and then like pass a pointer to it like if, if it takes a string reference, for example, if there's a C++ API that takes a string reference, you could construct a string in Rust, then like pass the pointer to it. And assuming like, hmm. assuming the C++ function is fine with that, which, which it should, it, it, it <coughs> should, then like you can just return normally. But yeah, finding with C++ is a fun topic. <laughs> okay, so that's pretty much it now. Uh, and the slides disappeared. <laughs> so, hey, okay. So that's pretty much it. The slides are on that URL. Uh, the binding repo is in the first slide, which I guess I should like. <clears throat> third slide, actually. Um, and yeah, like, please, like, if you want to like help out or. If you use it and find any trouble with it, please file issues. I'm happy to help or whatever. Um, and that's pretty much it. <laughs> Hello, everyone. If you're outside, come in because we're going. What? No, not yet. Maybe in two meetups, I'll start threatening.
Uh, hey everyone, I am uh, Alexi Bangesner or Alexis Bangesner, or a lot of you might better know me as this anthropomorphic Adobe Flash file known as Gankro. Uh, much like my pronouns, my name is a choose your own adventure as long as it's unambiguous. Cool. Uh, so today I am here to talk to you about uh, C Bindgen. My talk will be uh, significantly shorter than the previous two because C Bindgen is doing a much simpler job, which I don't know, I'll get into why in a bit. So what is CBindGen? CBindGen is a tool that creates C or C++ headers for REST libraries. Um, there's the GitHub repo for it. Uh, it's just hosted under the guy who's the primary developer of it, Ryan Hunt. Uh, you can use it as a library in Cargo, or you can just uh, do Cargo, install CBindGen, and use it on the CLI if you want. So why does CBindGen exist? Um, it exists because of WebRender. WebRender is what uh, I work on at work. I work on the uh, Firefox graphics team. Uh, and it's a rewrite of uh, Firefox's uh, graphics backend in Rust. And at, be, due to the nature of a rendering backend, it's kind of a leaf in the program. So it's just a lot of C++, which is all of the legacy code in Firefox, which one day we will surely rewrite in Rust, <laughs> calling into Rust. Um, and we just decided that managing these bindings by hand is way too error prone. So let's make a tool that just does it for us. So what can CBindgen do? Let's see. Sorry, this is echoing a bit. Um, so uh, the first and simplest and most important thing it can do is it can take a pub extern no mangle function and export it into a C++ header, C or C++ header. Uh, all of my examples I'll be looking at C++ uh, because that is what we use in Firefox. Um, so here there's uh, three arguments, a U32, a mutable reference to a U32, and an optional mutable reference to a U32. And we just bridge that into C++ at uh, those unions. Uh, you have to mark the struct as repr C, um, and it's to only contain things that repr C or basic primitive types. And the gen is really straightforward. Again, we have a U3 bool, and we emit UT. Hooray, simple. Um, tuple structs also work, although they're a bit jankier. Um, because C, plus, C and C++ plus plus don't support like numbers as a field name, we just put an underscore in front and call it a day. <laughs> uh, type defs, those also work. Uh, for whatever reason, probably it works better with namespacing. C bindgen prefers outputting using for C++. Plus plus. Um, we support field lists or C-like enums. Uh, in this case, uh, because we're using C++, we get to use enum classes, which are nice and namespaced. And you can explicitly just be like, give it this size. Um, uh, note that you have to put repr u32 on your enum. Every single thing except for type defs, you need to put a special repr annotation on it so that Rust knows, hey, I would really like this specific layout. Otherwise, we don't know the layout, and we can't do anything. Uh, the thing I'm really excited about, because this is part of a really big yak shave that I did, um, is we actually support field full, field full enums as long as you put this repr annotation on it. So here is a C version of option that only uses U32. Um, and we emit this big, complicated union. Um, it's really hard to understand if you don't know a bunch of subtle tricks in C, C++. But basically, you can access the tag manually, or you can access each individual body manually, and it works. Um, we also support emitting uh, conveniences for field field enums, so you can pretend you're still in Rust code. So here I do auto val equals C option U32 colon colon sum, just like you would do in Rust. Uh, and sadly, I do not have nice pattern matching in C++, so I just do is the value sum. If so, then just stab right into the union and grab the field. Again, underscore zero because I can't use zero. <laughs> um, the one of the so that feature and this feature combined are kind of the big reasons to use Cbindgen over. I'm told Rusty Cheddar, which is our kind of main competitor. 
uh, we support generic structs. Uh, so here I have my generic struct of T, uh, contains an array of T, and CBind gen's like, cool, I'll admit a template for that, because um, the layouts match as long as you mark your struct as for C. <laughs> um, if you're in C or for whatever reason you don't want templates, you can uh, get instantiated instead. So here uh, I have a public stern fun that's no mangle, it has to be no mangle. That is a very big pitfall that I've run into many times. If you forget the no mangle, it just won't show it in your output and you'll be very confused. So if you ever have problems with CBind gen, be like, did I put the no mangle? <laughs> um, so yeah, I use a my generic struct of uh, bytes and CBind gen is like, cool, I'll generate my generic struct underscore U8. Um, perfectly reasonable. So. How does C so there's a bunch of stuff C Bindgen can do. How does it work? Um, all it does is it looks at a library you give it, a Rust library you give it. It finds all the no mangle pub extern funds, uh, and then it exports those into the header, uh, and then it looks at all those types, those those function signatures reference, and it exports those. Then it looks at those types and finds the types they reference, it exports those, and so on and so on and so on, until you have everything your header needs. Note, this is a hacky parser. It is not a proper Rust parser. There are some things where it could just blow up. <laughs> um, if you want to make, if you run into that and want to make it better, PR is welcome. <laughs> so let, let's look at an example of how it works. Um, here I have my no mangle pub extern fun process. It takes an input and outputs a bool. Sibangen will look at that and go, cool, what's an input? Oh, I, and then I'll look th through all the declarations for input, and I'll go, oh, hey, there's a struct input. I'll put that in the header. Oh, wait, it also, that references data. I need to find data. Oh, cool, that's an enum. I'll export that. So it just spires through your program, gives you everything you need. Um, so how to use it, as I mentioned before, uh, you can use it as a lib in your build.rs, or you can use it as a CLI tool. Um, the web render developers prefer it as a CLI tool, as well as I do personally. Um, I find the CL using it as a CLI tool is a bit better supported in that it, I found the build.rs mode kind of will sometimes swallow errors, so it's harder to debug. Um, using it as a CLI tool, we also um, in WebRender with WebRender, we actually check in the the built files, um, so that lets us just code review it, and it also makes it not a build time dependency for anyone. They don't need to know how to use CBind Gen, and it won't try and run CBind gen for everything every single time you do a build. Um, the Stylo devs have recently started using CBind gen. How do you prefer to use it? So we, well, so I left it on Arch like two weeks ago, actually. And we ran it. Right now, the setup is the same as WebRender. We need to do it in But people complain how I turn it into a dependency. OK, are you, uh, so. Okay, so you're still not using build.rs. Okay, cool. So the answer is currently they're using it exactly like WebRender does, but they want to uh, make the CLA tool part of the actual uh, required build system so that you can't get it wrong. That is kind of the problem with the way we do it in WebRender. You can forget to run it, and then things might go wrong. As it is, there's a single person who handles the WebRender update vendoring, so they just have it in their vendoring script, run <laughs> Um so now I want to, uh, I made a, a simple example of uh, using CBindGen. I will not be live coding this. I will just be walking through the code. <laughs> you will have to trust me that it runs. <laughs> um, so uh, here's uh, the basic, what you need, what, what a project that wants to use CBindGen needs. So you want to have some sort of bindings library, and this will basically just declare a bunch of pub extern funds and hooray. Um, you need your cargo.toml because it's a Rust library. Um, it, the cargo.toml is very simple, and there's, uh, we'll just declare the kind of library it is. Uh, you'll have your lib.rs file. Um, you'll have a cbindgen.toml file. Um, this is usually pretty simple, but it basically lets you declare all of the weird configs you want. Like, I think we have a bunch of preferences for what the like coding style is in your code base. Do you like camel case methods or Pascal case methods or underscores? Like very important things. Um, 
and then I have a basic build script, which will work on uh, Linux or Mac, uh, because both of those have G++, and that's very easy for me to implement. <laughs> um, and then you have a main.cpp that uses your code. So uh, let's hop into this. Hopefully this will work. So first I'm going to look at what is the like, structure and the when you're using Sorry, what? Yeah, sorry. We don't uh, import methods or anything. We, don't, we only import public stern funds. <laughs> um, so really complicated, uh, super duper complicated. Um, oops, go back, please. Our cobgar.tunnel is similarly very simple. I like to have a static lib because I want to link in my REST code as a static library. Uh, if you wanted to use your build.rs, you would add it, you would add cbungin as a build dependency here. Uh, let's look at our lib.rs. So our lib.rs here is the incredibly sophisticated features we want to expose to C++ that you would never be able to do in C++. Um, we want to maybe double a number or actually double a number. <laughs> um, and here I use map just because I can. Uh, and also in here, I sprinkled in a bunch of like type declarations and stuff just to show that it works. Um, fun trick if you want to test something, just make a dummy function because whatever. <laughs> uh, cool. So let's look at our let's look at our build script. So our build script is very simple. Uh, as a prerequisite, you should cargo install dash dash force engine. Force just says, please overwrite any old versions because the newest version is the best version. Um, so using cbindgen is really easy. You write cbindgen, name of library, dash o, header I want to make. That is everything you need to do to use cbindgen. Hooray. Um, then you just go into your li Rust library and build it. Uh, and then you tell uh, G++, hey, uh, you should look for libraries inside the release directory of my Rust library. And I'm just going to make this a bit bigger. You should look for libraries in my release directory. And please link in the library Rust bindings. Note dash versus underscore because of weird legacy reasons. Um, and then here, just build main.cpp. So what is main.cpp? All it does is include our generated bindings and then call our functions. And as far as it's concerned, hey, these are just C functions. So what does our generated header look like? Uh, generated bindings. So uh, by default, cbindgen imports standard int and standard lib uh, just to get some nicer types like UN32D. Um, so here's our C option. It emits a tag and some bodies. And then here's our nice convenience methods that are all very simple but would be annoying to write yourself. Um, here's our struct. Here's our tuple struct. Here's something generic. Here's our using. And then here's our externs. And they're all really straightforward because cbindgen is doing an easy job. And the, the reason why cbindgen is doing an easy job is because there are two kinds of things in Rust. Very simple things and things that the compiler de developers say, this is explicitly undefined. Please stop. <laughs> <laughs> I have tried many times to ask them to like define more things or give me like a weird hacky way to like just get into a Rust type and use option natively. And they're like, please stop. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, some pitfalls with using cbindgen. Um, it does not respect namespacing. So if you have so in Rust, it's a semi-common pattern in Rust to have two separate modules that declare a type with the same name, and you're just expected to use the full path as like the full name. Uh, cbindgen just kind of hoists everything into one namespace. So that will blow up and clash, and you'll be sad. Um, and the reason it's like that is because our parser is super hacky. Um, we don't support non-pod types, uh, because that would be hard. <laughs> and we don't really need it uh, for what we're doing. 
uh, in, in WebRender. That might be an interesting project to work on, but it would be messy. Oh, sorry. Non-pod types are uh, types with destructors or like, I guess in Rust it's only types with destructors, but in C++ there's also like move constructors and copy constructors and assignment constructors. So basically things that you can't just mem copy. Um, I believe there's also weird ABI implications if you start using non-pod types. Uh, I don't know the full details of that. Uh, Emilio seems to agree. So. <laughs> uh, also, uh, it doesn't work if there's like any repr rest type, and repr rest is the default for every single type in Rust. So option, vec, everything but the primitive types is repr rest, and you have to explicitly be like repr c, repr u32 to get everything to work. Um, this generally means you just have to kind of control the whole ecosystem you're trying to get into your into your APIs. With web render, we do. Um, it just it generates the repr rust, but it's an opaque type though. Uh, yeah, so. so it's, not, it's not like it's not showing up, it's just like, I can't move semicolon. For pointers, yeah. But like if you try to pass a repr rest type by value, we can't handle that. Um, and you might be like, oh, you could just figure out the size and the alignment, but like C++ APIs are way more complicated than that, and you can't just, you, size and alignment is not sufficient for uh, passing something by value. Um, please come alive. Wake up, wake up, there we go. Um, so yeah, th this is cbindgen. Um, the primary maintainer, Ryan Hunt, asked me uh, to mention that um, it's kind of in maintenance mode right now just because no one is like super excited to actively work on it because it's kind of good enough for our, our, our use cases right now. So if you want to help maintain it, uh, feel free. Again, the repo for it is here. Uh, e Curion slash C uh, Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, uh, cube. Where's the cube? cube. cube. Uh, uh, so you showed a few very Linuxy things up there, and Mac OS is Linux and pretty. Uh, how well does all this work on Windows? Uh, what is Windows specific here? I mean Windows Win32 API, like not any of the weird new stuff. Um, I'm not sure what you're thinking of exactly. Well, but basically, I have a library that I've compiled to a DLL, and I need to link it to a .exe that's written in C++. What do? Does it work? It should work. Like basically, extern the the repr annotations and the extern annotations in Rust tell Rust to try its darndest to look like C for your local platform. Uh, and CBindGen like doesn't really do anything smart. It's just like, hey, strike. Uh, Sing Rust is a lorry muddy store. It's it's a mess. <laughs> Um, the like official ways to parse things have long been like unstable or nightly only, and we only really need to support a subset, so we just support that subset. And there is another follow-up question because you mentioned that um, the Rust standard lib option uh, guarantees uh, a pointer likes uh, layout. Is does that mean it's a, it's a special type? If I implement my own uh, option, then it will have a completely different layout. So I don't know if we guarantee this, but in practice, anything that looks like option acts like option. The compiler just looks at the shape of option. It doesn't special case option. But we only guarantee this for option itself. Anything else? Oh, uh, I'm not sure if I mentioned this. Uh, the, gen the template stuff does not work for gener uh, generic functions. And the answer for that is because the Rust compiler devs don't tell us how those work, and they are not willing to guarantee how they work. And also, C++ templates are complicated, and I don't want to try and make them talk to each other. <laughs> Any other So um, I have I actually have like one PR open for C engine for uh, wrapper transparent. Okay. Um, and I'm looking into another.
uh, if you define like a prefix, the prefix is omitted if it's if if you use a constant in a array size. Okay. So it generates wrong wrong header. Um, is is there like who would I like how how would I approach this if if, if like because right now I'm kind of kind of kind of stuck. You're just, um, yeah. So the best person to contact is R Hunt on the Mozilla IRS, IRC. Um, you could also ping me, but I'm not super experienced about it. Okay. Again, I'm Gankro, G A N K R O, everywhere. I typed the big MC by the end for unrelated reasons. So. Oh, good. Father Emilio. Father <laughs> <laughs> um, Emilio. Oh, yeah. I forgot to mention um, in the Sibanjin repo, there's a big list of all of the like things you can put in your Tamil. I believe this list is not complete uh, <laughs> because it's just not. Yeah, so like the enum one I used is just not in here. Uh, Pierre is welcome to improve our documentation. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, five minutes ago I added the PR for adding documentation for uh, for what is it like um, defines, which are also missing. Sweet. <laughs> All right. Um, thanks for. So, uh, that was our last talk of the day. Ooh. Um, we, I think theoretically the event ends around 10. Uh, so we're gonna, like, we're gonna keep everything open so you can hang out in the kitchen and talk to people, talk to the speakers, or just talk to each other, or discuss, I don't know, pull requests <laughs> or something. <laughs> I don't know what less people do. Well, that, why am I here then? Well, whatever. Um, so yeah, but um, we're not setting a hard limit at 10. We're just kind of like saying, hey, we want to go home at some point too. So we're just saying like, please consider us. Um, but yeah, um, is there anything else? These talks should have been recorded theoretically. Do we have a YouTube channel? Yes, the talks are recorded. They will put be put on the Rust Videos YouTube channel as soon as I get them. Um, we will probably eventually have another meetup like this. We do have the two weekly Rust Hack and Learn. If you're writing Rust, if you want to learn Rust, drop by. Um, and other than that, thanks again for the speakers. And thanks again. <laughs> oh yeah, the show and tell. When is it again? 28. 28th, we have the show and tell. We now have three kinds of meetups. We have the show and tell on the 28th. Look it up, uh, join us there as well. Thanks. That one. <laughs>